with July 4th being this past week, uh, and it being 248 years, I have to admit, I did have to look that up, but it being 248 years since the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, I've been reminded uh, of how our history and how we pass down that history uh, and tell the story of where we came from, that that matters. And as a nation, our Declaration of Independence declares, it begins, right, with words that you probably know well. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words have shaped us as a nation and as a people, as did when we think of William Penn, who was, that, who was uh, given the land of Pennsylvania, right? And he established a freedom of worship for the province of Pennsylvania, that that has shaped our history too. It shaped us, our history as Mennonites, that we could come here and worship in our own way. Uh, and Penn's experience of religious persecution for joining the Society of Friends or Quakers shaped his life experience. Penn was a, would have been considered a religious radical of his day, right? He believed Christians should be able to worship as they saw fit and not have to conform to the state church. Uh, and so we as Mennonites were also religious radicals of the Reformation in baptizing adults upon confession of faith, uh, worshiping outside of the state church. But religious radicals did not begin with the Anabaptist movements of the Reformation, but I would argue much, much earlier, uh, all the way back with ancient Israel. Over the next eight weeks, we're going to be looking at the first three chapters in Genesis that provide us with foundational truths for understanding God, the world in which we live, and ourselves. And I've entitled this first, these next eight weeks, Trustworthy Words About God's World. But as I was preparing for this first message uh, of the series, I'm reminded that these opening chapters, uh, they're not only trustworthy words, but they are really a series of radical truths. Uh, now, you might be asking, how so? How is Genesis 1 and following radical truths? So I want you to imagine with me three different scenarios. So it's going to be a little bit of creative reimagination here, but go along with me. So scenario one, right? Imagine that you've grown up gathering straw to help make mud and bricks for the large storage cities of Pharaoh. You gather day in and day out under the hot sun, uh, under the watchful eyes of the overseers, not enough, and you felt it in stripes across your back. You are now many days journey away from that land and that people, having seen incredible and at some points terrifying sights that you can hardly explain, right? You saw frogs in uncountable numbers, hail and darkness, and waters that held back as you journeyed through them. You wonder to yourself, who is this God? Who is Yahweh? Who has rescued us? Who is giving us food on our journey and water in this wilderness place? You might have heard stories from your ancestors about this God and their journeys. But you have also seen all your life, all around you, the grand temples of the Egyptian gods of Amun and Isis and Horus and Hathor and Thoth and Ptah. And you have seen their priests and their elaborate processions in the streets. And you've heard the stories of how the gods came to be as they formed the world in which uh, they are found. You know of their power and their influence. And you've always felt this mixture of curiosity and awe and maybe some confusion and fear about them. So here you are, this early Israelite. Can you sense the uncertainty as they're being drawn out by Yahweh to a new place, uh, to a new way of worship? Or imagine, in a different scenario, a little several centuries later, you've lived your whole life in a family village atop one of the many hills that make up your family's territory, the tribal territory. You're a part of the tribe of Judah. Uh, and you've always been kind of proud of that fact because uh, the royal house comes from Judah. 
and your family has olive groves on a terraced hillside over here, uh, and you've got some barley fields down in the valley floor, and you've got sheep and goats, uh, and you attend the festivals in Jerusalem from time to time, uh, commemorating Yahweh's rescue of you as a people and how he brought you through the wilderness. Uh, and uh, you have heard, but at the same time, right, you know of Yahweh's work on behalf of your people, but you have also heard of the ancient gods worshipped in this land. You've heard of Baal, and you've heard of Asherah, and you've heard from traitors how Baal is the, the god of the storms and how he defeated the deity of the sea. And you have heard of Asherah and how she attends to the fertility of the land and to the crops and to the home. And you have seen the shrine in your uncle's home and noticed the gifts he brings to Baal and to Asherah. And you've heard conversations that after the drought, uh, he does not want to offend the gods of this land, but secure their good favor. Can you see the confusion and maybe the fear? Can you feel it? You don't want another year of drought. You don't want another year of crop failure. Should you also attend to Baal and to Asherah to make sure that they provide the rain and the good growing conditions that your fields need, that your herds need, that your crops need? You don't know. Or imagine that you raised your family in the city of Babylon, last scenario, right? far from your homeland. 40 years ago, you were all taken captive, many of you, with, uh, to the city of Babylon, and you walked through this ancient old city with its massive streets, like nothing you've ever seen. Imagine walking into New York City after growing up on a farm in Lebanon County, right? Or Lancaster. Uh, and you've seen the massive ziggurat, these huge temples uh, to the god Marduk, Every year at the New Year Festival, you hear the proclaim and retell the story of how the world came into being through Marduk's valiant defeat of the evil and terrifying goddess, Imat. Marduk slayed her. He split her carcass into two. With one half, he formed the heavens, and with the other half, he formed the earth. Uh, and Marduk, through his great conquest, became the king of the gods and established the rules for the deities of the land, the rules and their, their roles. And this story declares that all around you, the gods present, they're present in the heavens, they're present in the storm, in the wind, in the waters. And can you feel the draw to engage just like your neighbors in this kind of worship? You know, there's the majesty and the awe of the temples and their rites and the processions. And you wonder, are these gods truly in charge? Maybe Marduk really is the king. I paint these scenes because ancient Israel lived in a world in which there were many, many deities, literally thousands of deities uh, in the various, known from the various peoples around them. When I went to look up just how many, in, I, they said in Egypt alone, right, there are thousands, and they probably haven't counted them all. There, certainly there were major ones. This was true right when they were coming out of Egypt, when they lived in the land of Canaan, when they went into Babylon in exile. All through their history, the peoples around them worshipped multiple gods, many gods. And these deities were not separate from the world, but they were really a part of it. They were connected to it. Uh, they were integral with the world that was around them. And the cultures all around them told of how the world in which they lived came into being. They all had origin stories, right? They all had stories that told of the creation and the origin of the world. And these stories are really tell also of the birth of the gods. As the world is created, the gods are coming into being. And so as the gods come into being and the cosmos comes in along with it, the gods, they, they control and they participate in the sun and the wind and the moon and the stars. And the gods often come about in these stories through procreation. Uh, they're quite graphic. We won't go there entirely. Uh, and they also establish authority through a lot of warfare and conflict, through slaying and killing and building the world through the carcass of other gods. Thus, these foundational stories shape a view of the world all around Israel that had three elements, right? There's many gods. There's a multiplicity of gods. 
There is conflict built into the system. And the deities are all a part of the world. They are built into the system. They're connected to it. They're continuous with it. They're not separate from it. Uh, so if you've seen the Disney movie Moana, you get an image of this kind of worldview, this way of looking at the world. Uh, and into this view of the world, and alongside these ancient accounts that gave voice to, to how the ancients looked at the world, God reveals to Moses, right, a radically different account of origin, which begins, right, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, if you've grown up in church, right, you've probably heard these words a whole lot of times. And if you've done Bible reading plans, right, usually they start with Genesis 1, and most of us make it to day one of our Bible reading plans. Even if we don't make it to day five, we usually get through day one, right? So you've read them a few times. The danger, of course, with familiarity is that we can forget to f and, or fail to see the wonderful and powerful truth that is proclaimed in these opening verses. The gift that these verses arched to us and were to them many thousands of years ago. So I want to make a few observations of, about the text, about these initial opening verses, and then um, we'll talk about the significance for Israel and for us. Now, much, much ink has been spilled on these initial verses. I won't go into all the discussions. I'm just going to kind of present uh, some of the foundational uh, points here. But the very first words, right, in the beginning, start by telling Israel and telling us that there was a beginning point. But a beginning to what? Not to God, but a beginning to God's work of creating, a beginning to his creation to the cosmos, heaven and earth. The fact that there is a beginning also anticipates that there is a larger story that will unfold, a larger work that God is doing. And the very first act of scripture is the simple act that God created, right? He begins by creating heaven and earth, referring to the cosmos. Uh, the word for create in Hebrew is the word bara. There's a nice sound play with the beginning of scriptures, Bereshit, bara, uh, Elohim. When used in the basic Hebrew verbal stem, as it is here, I won't do too much more of that, its subject is always and only God. In other words, bara, when it is used, refers to an activity that only God does, uh, and it results in a newness or a renewing. It focuses attention on the subject, God, he is the independent creator, and this is his initial act. Isaiah, in chapters 40 through 55, will also pick up on this language a whole lot. Barah occurs seven times in the opening chapter, chapter 1 through 2, 4 of Genesis, probably a significant number, uh, and then elsewhere in Scripture as well. But God's act of creating is focused on here. Verse 2 then depicts this initial state of of the cosmos, right, with three clauses. The earth is formless and void. It's tohu vavohu, uh, meaning it's, it's not ready yet for habitation. It's, it's not yet formed or filled. It's there. Darkness is over the deep, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. Now, aspects of this would have sounded familiar to ancient ears. This kind of primal state of creation is in many other creation stories. But from this, the gods would begin to emerge and begin to procreate or battle or subdue the various chaotic elements of the world. But here in Genesis, there's the early unformed state of creation, but no battle, no creation of the gods. The earth is not yet ready for habitation, but God has begun his work and everything is ready for what comes next. God speaks. So what's the radical truth that we find already in these initial verses, the trustworthy words? The words that blaze forth, the truths that come, I think is this, is that there is only one God who is distinct from his creation, 
who has no rival and who freely chose to create the universe. So there's one God distinct from the world he's made. He does not have rivals and he has freely chosen to make this world. So let's just unpack some of those realities for us. So for ancient Israel, this would have been a profound truth that God is distinct from his creation. He is not a part of it. He exists outside of and independent from the world he has made. And this is really, this we kind of might assume for granted, but it's foundational to scripture and it's foundational to Christian thought, uh, this fundamental distinction between God and everything else. God alone, right, is uncreated. There is no account in our scriptures of God coming into being. He brings the world into being. He is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And everything else, right, the universe is finite, even as grand as it is. It is temporal, even as long as it has been here, and is changeable. It is created. Genesis 1, 1 through 3, Three teaches us that God is transcended. He is outside of creation. But in his initial act of speaking, we also see that he's intimately involved in creation. He is imminent. He enters in. He speaks. And, and both of these themes will be traced throughout scripture, right? And we can, so we can know God, right? But even these opening verses challenge the idea that we can somehow package God right, that we can somehow fully grasp him. The songs this morning, right, they focus on the majesty and the awe of God. When we look at creation and recognize that this is the work of a creator who must be so much more grand than the world that he has shaped. This again is radical. In the ancient world, gods were part of creation. They didn't stand outside of it, but within it, they were connected and there was a continuity between the physical world, the gods, and humanity. Uh, so the gods were like humans, right? Just more powerful and stronger. And they're found in the physical world. And this is why in their stories, they're often jealous and fickle. And people try to appease them. And the role of people, which we'll look more at in a few weeks, but was to feed them and sustain the gods. But beginning in these verses and repeated throughout scripture is this one truth that God is other. He is not his creation. He is holy. He is other. He cannot be represented by creation or controlled and manipulated by people. Israel's history is a long struggle to move away from the realities uh, that you can somehow represent and package uh, and manipulate God, right? They, they continually fell back into these practices of seeking to make idols, and have gods that were more under their control and that were more containable to them. But what about us, right? Are we not tempted as well to fit God into an image that is comfortable to us? These opening verses invite us to recognize the awesomeness of God, the one who brought the cosmos into being. It invites us to a posture, right, of humility. We can't fully know him. Awe. He is more wonderful than we can imagine. And of wonder, right? A wonder at the creation we'll talk more about, but also just a wonder at who God is. I think I can so often get stuck, right, with blinders on. I look at this day with this problem, and I can't see much else. And I think Genesis 1 invites us, right, to look up at the stars and be amazed to look at the mountains, the growing fields, and the plants as we think about summer, right? Uh, and to pause, to recognize the beauty and the goodness of the world and its creator, right? To recognize that these are just his handiwork. So how awesome must he be? Uh, and so I invite us this week to remember when you've got the blinders on and there is one problem in front of you and it's consuming everything, right? How might we step into wonder or how might we step into awe at those moments and remember just simply the bigness of God, that he is grander than the world that he has made. Uh, and he is, has created it, but he is not a part of it, even as we can talk with him and engage with him.
And so Israel was constantly challenged uh, to not shape God simply into their image. Not only is God distinct from his creation, but we have one God with no rival. What becomes so evidently clear, and the reason I took a little while to help you imagine what the ancient world was like, is that these verses of in the, God, in the beginning God created uh, and carried throughout the opening chapter of Genesis is the reality that there is one and only God. And God does not compete. He does not procreate uh, with anyone else to bring about creation. God simply has no rival. And there is one creator of everything. What does this mean for ancient Israel? I think fundamentally it meant a freedom to live before only one God. And this in the ancient world was a liberating freedom from the bondage of many gods and the fear of trying to make sure you serve them all correctly. Genesis proclaims that the God who redeemed them was the very same God who also created them and all the cosmos. So they were free to worship and serve one God. And this was a radical freedom. In the ancient world, one person would attend, as I said, to multiple deities. You might have your household deity, who was your patron family deity. Then you might have the god who oversaw your town and your trade or your profession, the crops and the fields. And then your national god and maybe your imperial god. And so you would have layer upon layer of deity that you would make sure you were either sending gifts for, attending to properly, you would be worried about receiving bad omens from other gods and needing to placate those evil forces, or angry gods. And you knew the gods could sometimes be fickle and sometimes inscrutable. And so you carried out all the rituals day in and day out to keep them satisfied, earn their favor. Things might go well for you. Can you imagine the freedom to hear that none of that matters? Because there's only one God and it is the words of Jesus. I keep hearing the words of Jesus as if to the ancient Israelites, right? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You only have one God. There is one God, not many. And so, brothers and sisters, we fundamentally, right, proclaim that we have one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. And I think for us today as well, that this declaration proclaims a radical freedom from all that would demand our total loyalty, all that would seek to claim us, that we are dedicated to it, or that seeks to enwrap us in fear, right, to enslave us. And if we're honest, right, as we look around at the growing tribalism at times, whether in political parties or in other areas, they demand a totalizing loyalty. And we must resist such calls. Right, because we serve one God, and there is freedom in that. And there is a truth that we can proclaim, right? We have one creator, one Lord of all creation. So what does it mean practically? Uh, just a couple of thoughts, right? It means if we have one God and one Lord, we can speak truth as best as we know how. We don't get it all figured out. But we speak truth, and we speak truth in the places we need to speak it, whether that uh, be in homes or in workplaces. Um, think of Aaron and Moses before Pharaoh, right? Think of the prophets before the kings of ancient Israel and Judah, right? They spoke truth into those situations, right? Whether that to be to a Pharaoh, to a king, and Jesus, before the Pharisees, he spoke truth into those situations. Paul in the Greek Agora, following one God and speaking truthfully will likely not get us more power or more popularity, right? But it does bring freedom. It means to that, it means that we must resist, right? Giving into the fear of the moment. Because we proclaim that we have a creator who holds creation and he holds history. He has the beginning and the ending in mind, both of all that's going on around us and of our lives as well. Uh, this does not mean that we kind of stick our heads in the sand uh, and pretend things are fine, but it does mean we can look at the world around us and our lives 
and we can engage responsibly and faithfully, and at the same time, recognize it does not hold us captive, right? And so, just as I invite you to look at all in wonders, you know, I wonder what fear uh, we might set aside this week, trusting in God as our creator. God is the one who sustains his creation, right? There is freedom there. There was freedom from Israel to know they did not have to worry about Baal and Asherah bringing fertility. They could trust that God held those things in his hand. Lastly, I want to reflect on the fact that in these opening verses and chapters, we find nothing that causes God to create. And this is more drawing out from the text, right? God creates simply because he chooses to. In other words, God is not dependent on creation to sustain him, as the ancients thought about their gods. Creation in the ancient world, there was a reciprocal cycle, right? The God brought forth fertility and the humans harvested and gave it back to the gods to sustain them. And so creation sustained the gods. But in scripture, creation and us are unnecessary. God didn't need to create us. We are gratuitous. At first, this might sound a little strange or you might not think, well, how does that work? Um, maybe it seems like it even devalues us a bit. But listen to how Christopher Watkin expresses it. It's kind of a long quote, but listen. Uh, Christopher Watkin says, neither we nor the universe is necessary. We may be important precious, glorious even, but preciously and gloriously unnecessary. This is the first instance of a figure that we will encounter many times on our journey through the Bible. Sometimes we will encounter it as the figure of gratuity, at other times as the figure of superabundance. In a theological register, we might refer to it as grace. And we encounter this grace not first in redemption, but in creation. It is through grace that, Christ, that the Christian is born again, but it is also through grace that the universe is born in the first place. The cosmos did not need to come into existence. God chose to create it. It is an outflow of his love and his creativity, his joy and his abundance, uh, of his grace. The universe is an expression of the glory and the love of God. It is a profound gift. We are an outflow of his love, of his choice. As creatures, then, we become recipients, right? He is not dependent on us. We are recipients, right? We are recipients of existence. We receive meaning. We receive love. And these come from him. And it invites us, right, into a posture of thanksgiving, into a posture of praise that we have I've been singing throughout this morning. So we, again, we're not created to toil on behalf of God, but to be recipients of his love, right? To reflect him in creation, which again, we'll unpack more. Uh, but fundamentally, it's just a reminder, we were created out of that love of God. And so this morning, it just, as we think about one God, right? Who is distinct without rival, and who chose to create, I just invite you to enter into wonder through your week. How might you just step into awe for a moment? Uh, what fear might you lay aside as you remember that God is in control? He has no rivals. And where might you just simply enjoy the gratuity of the gift of life that we each hold and that is, surrounds us, the grace of creation? Let's pray. Father God, you created us out of your abundance, out of your love, out of the joy that flows in who you are, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, may we enter our weeks reminded of the wonder of a a God who has created all that is. May we lay aside the fears that entangle us, knowing you have no rival. And may we simply enjoy the beauty and the grace that finds us sometimes in the big and the small ways of our daily lives. 
And to you we give honor and praise and glory because there is none like you. We pray this in your name. Amen.